Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Odyssey House Journals. I'm Randall Carlisle, along with Rachel Santizo. Hi. Hi. You are looking different today. I am. I, I, explain your attire. Okay, so today I'm actually, well, I'm wearing a Utah Naloxone shirt because they're, they're just so powerful in our community. But really, it's my hat. It I, says I, H is for human. And what it is, is it's supporting uh, like education and people living with HIV. And so today I am supporting that, but I also love just the human, the word human, when we talk about anything that may be judged or, or stigmatized. So bringing out the human in it. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realize, especially like people my age, when we grew up through the, when, when the AIDS epidemic first hit and people were dying all the time, and, and people don't realize now that, I mean, almost everybody is living with AIDS now, thanks to modern medicine. Right, and safely living with it. Yes, exactly, exactly. Absolutely. So the more we talk about it, I think it's really important. Do the yellow fingernails have any significance or just a personal- like 10 different sunshines is what that is for. Boy, and we need some sunshine. People don't realize that these, these we record these a little ahead of time and we've had a week of rain and snow. So, okay, here's a little factoid. And this is a, this is a grim one that I just came across yesterday. A new report from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention finds more than 87,000 Americans died of overdoses in the 12 month period that ended in September of last year and that's a 29% increase from the previous year. And it's higher than any year since the opioid epidemic began in the 90s. And the largest increase took place, and I guess this makes sense, in April and May when people were experiencing fear and stress from the pandemic, the strictest lockdown measures were in effect and job losses were on the rise. And overdoses most frequently involved fentanyl and other synthetic opioids but also included meth, so. I'm not surprised by that at all. I'm not either, I, and I can only hope that people are seeking, uh, seeking help if they need it because there are so many resources out there. And the other thing is the pandemic seems to be approaching an end, and so hopefully that same stress won't exist, so. And it's also the isolation, right? Like where this population where isolation is not, it's, it's dangerous for us. So if you are feeling isolated, find creative ways to get outside of that. That could be Zoom meetings. That could be, there's so many different things in the park, but finding ways to step outside that isolation. And, and please, if you feel like you need help, please reach out and get help because there are, and we're not just pushing Odyssey House, but there are many treatment places and now with Medicaid expansion, you can virtually get into a treatment facility regardless of your ability to pay. Good point. Right? All yeah. right, without further ado, you want to introduce our guest? So I'm excited. Today we have Elias Coriel. And I met Elias actually when he was being released from prison. Um, and since then, we've still connected, and he is about consistency, he's about courage, and I am so proud of him, and I'm excited for him to share his story with the world. So Elias. Elias, turn on your video button and join us. There you go. Hey. Hello. <laughs> How are you Hi, doing? So there? I'm doing great. I'm just at work. I'm glad I got to take this chance to actually come and talk with you guys. This is the first time I've actually done this over a Zoom meeting, but... I'm excited. Well, well, tell us a little about yourself. You look like you're pretty buff and in good shape. Uh, so, um, yeah, I just like she said, I I take things serious. Uh, right now, I my routine is very serious to me, and I believe your routine defines everything and like who you are. So, like my routine, I take I take pride in like my work ethic. I don't really show up late. I don't skip days. I don't call in sick, really anything. And then also beyond that, um, I, I go to the gym quite a bit, um, at least six times a week. And on that top is of that, quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, it is. And then on top of that, I stay up on my meetings. So that's my routine right now. I take recovery, um, social life, and then just my emotional mental health 
all of that goes together hand in hand. And that's how I've managed to stay clean and sober. I've been clean and sober now for eight months. So all right. I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah. It's the first time I've done that without ever being in a program or ever being incarcerated. So, and yeah. during the pandemic even too. So that's yeah. really, I'm happy about that. Well, what led you to this point, right? Because you do come from being incarcerated and, and how did you keep that structure? Like what led you to incarceration and led you to this structure routine? So, I mean, just trial and error, you know, you kind of realize one day you kind of wake up and you're just sick of like what you're doing. You're sick of, for me, I always would gain something just to lose it again, you know? And the path that I found that kept leading to that is I would take shortcuts in everything that I did you know first it would start by just like calling into work or like taking a, just even a couple weeks away from recovery or just little stuff like that I never took it serious or I just be like okay I'm just gonna drink this weekend I'm just gonna use this weekend and it's just little breadcrumbs that lead you to the inevitable which is you losing your recovery honestly and just going full force but for me like that end road is sadly incarceration um I'm lucky enough to never overdose or anything but every time I do use it leads back to incarceration and I'm just sick of it like like you said you saw me when I got out of prison and prison's definitely a different it's a different road for some I mean some people go back and they get used to it I just never wanted to be that person so uh, sadly to say, like the laws are put in place for a reason, and it did help me see that I don't want to do that. What? Uh, how did you? How did you get in trouble? What? How did your drug use start? Um, so, do you want me just to, like answer the questions, or like go into my story, or how would you like this? Good. Whatever you want to do. This is a free for all podcast. What are you most comfortable with? Okay. Um, I mean, I can do your question. I'll stay with the questions. I mean, I like to get you guys involved because then I feel like that will answer other people's questions too that may have right. some. So I'll do that. Um, it started, I grew up on the reservation. I am half Native American and half Chilean. My father grew up, uh, my father was born in Chile, which is South America. And my mother is full Native American from Taos, Pueblo, New Mexico. And they met on their LDS mission and came out here. So um, the reason I say that is I grew up on the reservation and out there, there's not really anything to do. Um, just imagine dirt roads, wood forests, everything. I didn't really have anything or like power, or electricity, stuff like that. And so I was eight, honestly. And so kids find different things to do. And usually it's marijuana, you know, and then you already know everyone's already heard like the native americans alcohol abuse is a bad thing out there so my uncles and aunts were drinking heavily i was around that and then uh once you hit the age of 11 you go into like a traditional thing called the kiva and i did that and once you do that you're considered a man so basically they let you kind of go off and do what you want so at 11 I did. yeah at 11 so wow. i started smoking marijuana it's not like they let you go off and like, whatever, it's just you're starting to become a man and noticed in your tribe. So I started smoking marijuana, I started uh, experimenting with alcohol, just barely started drinking and stuff like that. And that's basically what led me to my use. It started very young. And then my mother or my father got a job out here and my mother went to BYU. So they saw that Utah was a better place for us to be at so we came out here to Utah and that was about when I was 12 years old I remember coming here I had really long hair down to like my lower back and everything I had it braided I thought it was cool because in the reservation that's how kids dress they had their hair ribbon braided all that stuff and then I realized that I was poor you know I didn't have money until I didn't realize that around the reservation. But when I came out here, I realized that and I had long hair. And like the second day, I remember 
a kid pulling my hair, like while playing football, he pulled my hair. We were playing like a uh, two hand touch football or tackle football. And he pulled my hair to like grab me. And I ended up getting in a fight over it just because uh, that's like a disrespectful thing when you're over there, you don't pull each other's hair or even like touch it. And yeah, like I almost like felt I was never like a part of anything. I moved here. I was the outsider when I moved here because I mean, my clothes weren't up to date. My shoes weren't up to date. Like even my haircut, my style was, wasn't up to date. Like the girls were like, oh, you have pretty hair like a girl. So just like stuff like that. I never felt a part of anything. And then when I would go back home to visit in New Mexico, then I cut my hair off, of course, just to blend in here. So I go back there to visit and they're like, why'd you cut your hair? What, you want to be like the white people or stuff like that? Because that's how the older generation thinks. They're very close-minded to like other people's ways, modern life's ways. And so it was like, even I went back there and I didn't feel a part of anything either. So I never like found my like, my medium, you know, where I could be a part of anything. And sadly, that's what alcohol and drugs, it got rid of that in every aspect. I never had to worry about whether I fit in. I didn't care. It got rid of those voices that tell you you're not good enough or that these aren't your people or they don't like you. And yeah, that's how it led. Honestly, that's how it started. And it got quite heavy when I hit high school. I started playing soccer all my life. And when I was in high school, like I started hanging out with the the jock kids and they like to drink and you know go and smoke weed that's what the popular people do in high school and my older brother him and I look exactly alike I have two brothers I have one that's younger his name's Juan Carlos I have one that's older and his name's Miguel he's only three years older than me but we look exactly alike he's just taller and the reason I say this is because he was 21 and I was 17 so he had an ID and I ended up taking his ID to go and buy alcohol. So in high school, I was able to buy alcohol already. And that's how it just started leading. I started getting in trouble here and there, got an alcohol ticket, get possession of marijuana. And I never quite, like nowadays, I look back and I wonder why did I not learn or like change and everything. But that's like the mindset as of a youth, you know, you don't learn from your like mistakes or anything and honestly I didn't I kept going and going and going and trying to just be that popular person trying to get lost in substances and I actually went to Utah State I got a scholarship to Utah State through my tribe so my Native American tribe paid for it I went out there and from there um, I chose to rush a fraternity which is even worse. So I'm part of Sigma Chi and I'm sure you know how fraternities are or yeah, they're very, um, I mean, there's a brotherhood for it, but I chose it for the wrong reasons. I re rushed it and joined it just to be part of the party crowd. So I started drinking even more heavily. And at this time I started experimenting with more drugs like cocaine and ecstasy. So from there, my drug use, it almost just like, it kept leading, kept baby stepping, kept baby stepping. And there are very many chances that I'd get in trouble and it'd be like, okay, I'm going to stop this time. But here it comes, here comes the weekend or here comes a new thing. And I wanted to be a part of it. So I kept drinking, kept using and using and it just escalated from there, kept getting locked up. And then even officers at the jail, Salt Lake County Jail, started to recognize me and see me. And then that's when you know you're like, have problems as you keep getting in trouble. And they're like, oh, you're back again. You're back again. Yeah, that's, 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 how, not a good, that's not a good thing to walk into the jail and they say, hi, Elias, how are you? Yeah, no, it's definitely not a good thing. And I'm sure like people from Odyssey House, they know this feeling of like, you're like feel stuck like I get out I I'm very comparative so I compare myself to a lot of people and like I was comparing myself to like my friends where they were in life and everything like they already had cars they already had their licenses they were like getting moving out and everything and I was still starting over and over and over again every time I got in trouble and I just never felt you know happy with myself and I feel like that's where drugs and alcohol came in 
And yeah, I'd say that's where my addiction started. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys want me to keep talking about it or explain like, how did you, I mean, get, I, how'd you get into prison? I mean, Oh, how? okay. Um, so, uh, prison happened. So one weekend when I was about 24 years old, uh, I was at a house drinking there heavily and uh, my friend ended up getting in a fight who I was with and this is in West Valley and I got stranded at the house there and so I don't know anybody there so I started to walk home and I'm like really mm -hmm. drunk I'm really intoxicated and I start to check sheds like it's the middle of October so it's cold outside I'm starting to check sheds to find somewhere to like stay out to even sleep or when anything I mean I could have called a ride I could have called anybody to come pick me up but I chose not to and at this time I found a garage that was open like the side door so I open the garage door I walk into their house I go I see that they have cars and everything and my mind's just like my mind like when I'm in that state my mind's very emotional and instinctive so like my mind just had its mind. I just had my mindset on just getting home or finding somewhere warm to sleep. And I ended up walking in their house, grabbing their keys to their car, getting in their car, opening the garage. And at this time, when I opened the garage, the guy heard me and he comes running down the stairs. He tries to grab me through the window. Um, I end up backing out backing out of the house or out of the garage down the driveway and he's getting dragged with me for a second and I turn and he gets thrown off the car so he's injured he catches an injury in his hand and at this time I'm like it's all or nothing I'm getting home I'm not getting caught I take off in the car um, police are behind me because the car has OnStar on it so they know exactly where I'm at at the time I'm going down Bangor, heading to West Jordan and a bunch of cops just start coming up behind me and it's almost like someone was literally controlling the car I try to open the door it's locked power steering goes out so I can't turn the car and they're already on me I try to open the window that's locked and the car's going and then it comes to a stop and when it comes to a stop the car like I hear the car unlocked like like someone unlocked it and then I hear the cops over the um their microphone saying that uh Mr or they're like or they didn't know who had the car but they're like throw out the keys you know so I throw out the keys out the window keep your hands out they do the little take two steps to the left take three steps back get on your knees all that yeah. and yeah so when I got to the jail, Salt Lake County Jail, uh, my charges were home invasion, which is a uh, five to life in prison. So you actually see that five to 25 years in prison, a life sentence, 25 years in Utah. So it was one felony, one, five to life, one felony, two, grand theft auto, felony, two, burglary of a dwelling, and DUI also. So like I probably had seven charges at the time. And that's literally when you're, I had no idea what was going to go on. I had no idea what happened. The unknowing is really like, I hope I never go through that feeling again, just sitting there and seeing your paper and having to call your parents and tell them your family, your loved ones and say, I'm in a lot of trouble. I do not know when I'm going to come home. And yeah, so that's what led me to prison honestly um just using you know alcohol like I thought it was just going to be one weekend but it's never just one weekend it's the thing with alcohol I'd say like drugs the inevitable end is you're going to get locked up of course you know but you may not it happens slowly some people it happens slowly some people it happens fast with alcohol people think that okay this weekend was happening nothing happened it was all fun and games it happens like that, but all it takes is one bad night for stuff to go bad because you turn off that thinking part. You know, we've all heard this. Your like frontal lobe turns off when you actually hit that drunk and you go into like your instinctive mode, which is all raw emotion and just impulsive. And literally, I went through that and it cost me three years of my life for that.
Did your mentality change when you were in prison? Is that when you, did you have the idea when I get out, I'm gonna do whatever it takes or, or how did that transition for you? So it transitioned. Um, uh, so let me tell you that, I'll tell you like my prison experience and how it transitioned through there. So I get, I've already done eight months in jail. I got sentenced to prison. I go up to the prison. I go up to the sentencing thing and they're telling me, oh, you're going to go home after a year. Don't worry. Like my, or my lawyers tell me you're going to go home after a year. Don't worry. You'll be okay. And I'm like, okay. And it's weird. Like when you hear that, your mind's already thinking of stuff that you can do when you go, get out, you know, like, what am I going to do better? What am I going to change? And so I go up to the judge and and the judge tells me, Mr. Coriel, um, APMP doesn't want you, but I need you supervised. And he's like, I heard the state's recommendation, but I'm going to go against it. And I'm going to sentence you to one to 15 years in the Utah State Prison for it. He's like, I believe you've had your chances and you don't plan on changing. And he's like, I hope this teaches you. And he says, good luck. And I hear that. And my mind's like, it's a total 180. You know, I had no idea what that was going to happen. I thought I was going up there with the chance of getting back out, but literally it was taken away. And when they tell you you're going to go, there's no ifs or buts about it. You're going to go. And so when this happens, I hear my mom get up and she's like, no, no, he's not supposed to go. They said this, this, they said that he's going to get let out all that. And He's like, ma'am, you can't get up in the courtroom and start yelling like, um, you can write me or whatever. My mom has very bad, like depression and she's very manic. And it was in this time, it was very hard for her. So she gets up and she actually gets arrested by the cops for getting up in the middle of the courtroom. So when I got sentenced to prison, I have to watch my mom get handcuffed. I have to watch all that. So I'm literally just like broken. I don't know what's going to happen or anything. I get to the prison and you get behind up in those gates, those big gates, and they close on you and you realize you're going to be here for a long time. And uh, the crazy thing about prison is you, unlike jail, you sign your property away, but in prison, you sign your body away. So they give you a body waiver, which is, a paper that says who's going to take over your body if you die. So they give you a paper. So you sign your property away for someone to come get it. And then they, they give you a body waiver that says, uh, if you die in here or whatever, who do you want to pick up your body? And well, literally that's, that's, when, yeah, that's when it becomes like real, like how serious it is. Like people, uh, you watch movies and stuff like that, and you're like, oh, yeah, that would be terrible. But at this point, you're really living it. Like, you you sign your body away to who you want to come pick it up. And, yeah, so that's when things I knew it was serious. I get to this section. Um, for some people, prison's very different. For me, it was pretty hard. I get to this section, and I have my chest tattooed already. I have a... Uh, chief head which is chief crazy horse on my chest this whole part and um, in there there's a gang called NPB which is native pride blood and I wrote I got I moved into a section which is highly crips which is TCG Tongan Crip gang so already they think that I'm a rival gang when I moved in there mm. and so that was already rough there was already tensions I had to keep telling them no I don't I'm not affiliated, anything like that. And I have kind of a, um, me being like a sports person and all that, I already have a cocky attitude. And in there, if you have a cocky attitude, things are going to be rough for you. Like if you think, if you're a pretty boy, if you think that you're cool, like you've done all this on the street, all that, it does not matter what you've done on the street. It doesn't matter if you're the coolest person or whatever. When you get in there, it's, everyone every man for himself basically you're alone no your reputation from the streets does not matter none of that matters so I get there and literally they um I get a visit from my father and he tells me um your mom tried committing suicide today uh she took all her ambient so 
I'm dealing with that. Like my emotions are high and I just want to take it out on somebody and take it out on anyone. And I'm outside in the yard playing handball with somebody. Um, I'm playing handball with the, the rival gang, one of the little, one of the members of him. And I end up getting in a fight with him. And when I get in a fight with him, um, I end up, you know, I can hold my own in a fight and I end up getting him like I beat him. But then when I get back to the section two days later, his cousins are in my section. So they come twice to my door. Um, two days in a row, they come to like beat me up. You know, the first day they jump me. Um, and when they come in there, it sucks because, you know, it's going to happen. I'm in my cell just sitting there and one comes, three of them come, one comes to watch the door. They tell my Sully to get out. He leaves because he has nothing to do with it. But two of them come in and when they come in, they like say this to you. They like say, get up or get naked. And when they say get naked, they mean take off all your clothes and go and push the button, go run down the stairs, go push the button and say that you can't live here. And so like, that's the most demoralizing thing anyone can do, you know? tell you to take off your clothes and go downstairs and push the button and tell the police that you can't live there. So it's either you're going to be labeled, uh, you know, a wuss, or you're going to be hold your own. So I stood up, I got in a fight. I ended up getting beat up the first time. I didn't say anything or push the button or call the cops the next day. Same thing. They come again around lunch. I get beat up again. Um, at this time, I, uh, lip my jaw all that's kind of like hanging I thought it was broken so I ended up going to the hospital there and when I got back I'm sitting there in the hospital and I'm sitting there and I'm just looking up like thinking what like you look at all the choices that you've done in life and like how everything's just gone like I have no one my friends aren't answering the phone my girlfriend at the time left me because I don't expect any woman to wait three years for you. Um, I can't tell my parents because they're just going to worry. Like I'm sitting there literally like with a, a feeder in my mouth because I can't chew. And that's when it starts to like hit you. What do I want to do with my life? Like, do I want to keep doing this? Do I want to live like these people who are in here for the rest of their lives? Or do I want to change it? And honestly, I wanted to change it. Like I, there's no other way. There's no question about it. I do not want to come back here. I do not want to deal with this. I do not want to feel powerless. Like that's the most powerless I have ever felt in my life is like getting held by someone and getting punched. Like it's literally, it's, you see the movies and stuff, that stuff really does happen there. And the sad part about the justice system is the officers know that it's going on. Like they know you get beat up. They know that people are getting beat up. They know that people are getting raped in there. They know all that. But the way the justice system, I believe it works is they're like, okay, as long as we take these people away from regular citizens and put them all in a place together, then we have no problems. Like they can do what they want. Like some officers believe this, they can do what they want just as long as they're not hurting the public. And that's literally how some of the prison is. Like there's drugs everywhere. There's all that. And that's our justice system right now. It's sad, but there's no like help for those kinds of people. I mean, there is, so at the, when I'm laying there, I chose to go to Conquest, which is a two-year program in the prison. Right. So I went to Conquest, and I already have it in my mind. I'm not going to go back to prison. I'm not coming back. This is all going to be behind me. So I instantly start getting in leadership roles. I start uh, running these CrossFit meetings there, addicts to athletes. I start running them. I start getting involved in any way that I can because I know I want to change my life. This is not where I want to be and I start just reading out of the big book I start listening to all that stuff working the steps like that stuff is real like you won't believe it but that stuff is real it really does help and some people would be sitting there and be like yeah I can never do that I can never like I thought I could never be that person like I used to be that person that would just be like I'm just gonna get high for the rest of my life and 
it's okay. Like if I die, I die. But once you like get to that, everyone has a rock bottom and my rock bottom was sitting in that hospital room in the, in the prison, sitting there with a feeding tube in my mouth. That was my rock bottom. Like I knew I did not want to get there. And so I've done everything I can. I got out. Um, I was in there 2017. I got at, at the beginning of 2017. I got out towards the end of 2020. And at, right when I got out, I did exactly what they tell you to do. I went to a meeting. I started searching things at this time. This is where I met Rachel. I went to Fit to Recovery right after because I heard about it. I started getting involved in any way that I can. Like I started searching for help. I did not want to link up with the friends that I had. I did not care about anyone. Like you can say that there are real friends in there, but your friend, you'll find out who your friends are at your lowest points. And I found out that I only had like my family at my lowest point. Like I did not get one. I only got one visit from one friend consistently. Like I did not get any visits from any friends. I did not get any letters, none of that for three years. So it's just, I hope that no one has to go through that, but you know, literally I, that's what I went through. Yeah. I want to point out that you, like you shown up and you've just been consistent and like all that identity you know, struggles that you went through, like led you to be the man that you are today and, and sharing your story. It's been incredible to hear. Like, I, I mean, I know you, but now I really know you and um, I'm even more honored to know you. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, the things that you're doing, right, you are showing up, you are doing meetings, you're doing all those things. And now you're creating like this version of yourself that you never like thought you could be right. And it was from being incarcerated. And I know that you're a good son today. Yeah. I think the biggest part is that you get to be a son today. And, and, and the whole point of this podcast is so other people who may have be in the situation that you were in years and years ago see you as an example and, and know that things can happen. So so we appreciate yeah. you sharing this with us. This this podcast is one of the most watched podcasts dealing with addiction and recovery. And just so we let people know, you can watch it on YouTube. You can listen to it on iTunes, Spotify, or iHeart. Uh, so we, and we're heard all over the world. Uh, Rachel even has a Russian boyfriend who listens to it. So <laughs> Igor. that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Like, I just wanted to, like, bad things do happen in life. Like, I don't get me wrong. Like, my life isn't completely without sadness, without I mean, I still have to deal with stuff like just two weeks ago, it was the anniversary of like my ex-girlfriend committing suicide. And it's just things like that. Like life does happen. It's just today I still am the same person. I still have the same uh, thought patterns and everything. The only difference is, is that I recognize them and like I learn to accept my circumstances. Like literally I'm... I barely bought a car at 29 and before that would hurt me or whatever, but literally now I accept it for what it is. And I don't compare like what I have. It's just my story. And like, this is my life. It doesn't matter about what I have or what I don't have. I'm happy today. And that's what I do love is yeah. just, I've learned to accept my circumstances for what it is. And that's the biggest thing I could tell anyone to help them like quit trying to fight say why is my life like this why is it no just accept it and just move on like I went through all this for a reason all this is happening to me for a reason but what am I going to do with that well you so, are the finest example that recovery is possible I think that's a great slogan for everyone to remember so thank you for sharing your story with us thank you Rachel and thank you for watching Odyssey House Journals.